This is um, a day in the rain. I'm probably getting that slightly wrong. Um, and quiet those, day in the rain. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, mm-hmm. we're going with the broadcast yes, order, we which are. is different than the DVD standard very release good, order. Very good point. Yes, we're going with the uh, order as it was broadcast on television. So this is episode 26 in overall order, last chronologically. Just a little bit of jumping around there. Yeah. And this is an episode that is fairly inexpensive in terms of animation. So there's a lot of repeated animation. There's a lot of stuff that is um, um, uh, just static. Slow, still, mm-hmm. not a lot of motion, but a lot to take in. And, yeah. And it, it it's deceptively f- fast mm-hmm. uh, viewing. Right. Despite the lack of uh, high-speed action. It's one of the impressive things about this show is that they take an episode that's just about Kion going down to pick up a heater. That's the plot, really. That's the whole thing there. <laughs> and, Spoilers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, the, the dynamics of yeah. the relationships, it, it really gives you time to pause mm. and think and reflect. I just noticed something, some actually. High-speed enemy. Yes. Um, what they show there on the, the thing... Uh, that's the video game they played, I think. Hmm. Oh no, it's not. It's something. It, it is three, but it's not. It's um, Tundra Gunslinger Three. I have no <laughs> idea what that is, but it sounds awesome. Um, but those are the four laptops. Those are the the laptops they got. They, from, uh, they needed later those on. to play the game in there, didn't they? <laughs> in the future, in in a later. But they episode. got to keep them afterwards. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so I, I but think that's a different episode. Yeah. So so there. It's funny going uh, with the broadcast order Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of different references sometimes to an episode that has yet happened or has not yet happened and once you know that the others has have happened then you can say oh that's what that was (laughs) in a previous episode and it makes sense yeah and i think it's one of the things that makes the show fun is that you're watching things and wondering okay is that a reference to the future or not foreshadowing or foreshadowing (laughs) maybe (laughs) Hey, what are they doing there? <laughs> <laughs> so it's December, which is a bit of a jump from before. Uh, just a couple episodes ago, we were in the, uh, on summer break with that murder mystery. Mm-hmm. And now we've got everyone um, in the winter. And I think this, you know, a good example of what you're talking about, one of the things they do in this episode is show you a lot of little things um, over the course of the episode that to um, sort of draw you in. So there's bits about the weather. There's bits about... Um, this heater that Haruhi apparently scammed out of a guy. Um, <laughs> there's bits about uh, the characters and what they're doing. Uh, you know, Yuki's there reading. And so they spend a lot of time. And then, of course, there's the little bit with um, uh, Mikuru, who's now going to get photographed in various compromising positions. Um, I love how, at this point, Kion just leaves. You know, <laughs> like, okay, this is happening again. Um and so it is a very quiet episode. Not much happens. And you, you see what's interesting here, too, is their choice of camera angle. Oh, wow. In, in the introduction, you see all around their, 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 their club room, mm-hmm. all sorts of details. The games yeah. they're playing, yeah. the, just lots of details. And it gives <laughs> you time to take all that in mm-hmm. and really say, yeah, it's not just uh, this fuzzy kind of out there place. Yeah. These people are spending their time there. They're mm-hmm. enjoying it and... It really adds the character yeah. to the room, and it, it's one of the one of the ways that you can kind of have fun with the the show is looking at the club room and seeing how it's decked out, what's there in that corner, what isn't there yet, what might be there. The bookshelf. There, yep. <laughs> Where it is in relation to the wardrobe for the co- <laughs> the cosplay. <laughs> There's Kozumi with his white card from the uh, Adventures of uh, Mikuru-chan film, He's holding that up for the, the good photos. for bouncing the light. Yep. Um, so yeah, we have some, um, uh, and what's also interesting too is the contrast here between their room, which is uh, quite bright, and the, the outside, and this very drab outside. And it's, it's where I think this episode is kind of going thematically, is it's contrasting the excitement and the energy and all the fun they have in the room with the very quiet uh, normalcy. Outside, <laughs> outside, cold, rainy. Uh. Every day. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I must mention their uh, creative use of 
convenient obstacles uh, whenever Mikuru is being stripped. Uh, Yuki just happens to stand up just at that moment uh, and block with her head any view we might have of that. Oh, Which is... Uh, That's uh, probably safe. Yeah, <laughs> quite safe. We even see um, Mikuru's outfit flying across the room at one point. Um, but it's very creatively done. And yes, it, it's, a, it's a quiet episode, but it's very carefully constructed of seeing how the characters are talking back and forth, what they're doing, um, and Kion's sort of progress to and from this shop. What's also interesting here is he expects there to be some sort of nefarious stuff going on with the shop owner. How did she twist his arm and <laughs> force him into giving us this, and this it's heater for the... Yeah, <laughs> and it's kind of strange because she just mentioned that they're doing another movie and so he's giving that to them as kind of a down payment, if you will, or as kind of his contribution. A second movie. Yeah. But he acknowledges that the first movie didn't generate any sales for him whatsoever. Not even not even anything. No, it's about the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, But he's going to underwrite the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Which is it's interesting. I mean, on, on the one hand, it does get across the power of Hirohi's personality. But also, it is about the fact that there are people around who are just, you know, happy to help out. Yeah. Which is always good. Exactly. And then you have this wonderful sequence. So this is where folks started to complain a little bit, um, but you realize how funny it is on the, on the backside. Um, there's this long shot of just Yuki sitting in the room, turning the paper on her book. She's just reading the book, <laughs> and it goes on for minutes. Um, but you hear, very faintly, the drama club in the next room. And they're rehearsing what sounds like <laughs> something insane. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's just all sorts of these strange lines of dialogue. And uh, I, I'm surprised she didn't force any of them into the movie. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> well, they're not brigade members. No, so they no don't belong they're, in they're ordinary people. <laughs> they're not espers. They're not time travelers. Right. But what you, what, um, what you notice uh, um, as you're listening to that is that the voice actors playing them are the same voice actors playing the SOS Brigade. And in fact, they even, one of them calls the other one Yuki. And the dialogue they have about each other is kind of interestingly revealing about the characters. Um, so I won't spoil you know, any of that, but you know, pay attention to what they're actually saying, and it's kind of interesting seeing how the characters talk. And, and the audio, of course, since it's from the next room, is kind mm, of low and yeah. muffled. So if you're not paying attention, you, you miss <laughs> out on some of that dialogue. You say, hey, why did it get silent? silent? You know, Turn up the volume, listen to the dialogue. It's, it's, it's a riot. It's great. Um, it's also interesting seeing how they, just for this one episode, they change the room around a little bit, where the table gets shifted over to the corner, um, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, actually. Hmm. But it does get across the fact that this is a, a different um, day than normal. Something's a little bit off. It's a skew. It's a skew, exactly. <laughs> and this is kind of an askew episode because nothing is happening. You know, it, it should be an episode where there's all sorts of strangeness, but nothing's happening. And then Kion comes back and everything's... And we get the wonderful little bit with uh, Tsuriya-chan the uh, the very energetic bubbly girl, uh, who she has so much energy, it's 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 it, it rivals Haruhi. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it's that rapid fire. Hi, I'm looking for Mikuru. Is she here? No. Okay, click. Goes the door, and uh, she's over there. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, boom. boom. <laughs> <laughs> and Pokion is hauling that heater nice all the way up the gray hill. gray day. Oh. At least it's not raining. Yeah, sure. Yet. About to. <laughs> and so they're they're doing poses in the hallway. Bouncing more light. Bouncing more light. What oh, light? Look at how animated she is. She is yeah. jumping all over the place. <laughs> all she's doing is asking for help cleaning up, but she's all over the place with that. And now she's volunteering to help with the, the poses. <laughs> she's just the life of the party. Uh. And again, it, it is really getting across how just dreary. Cold, mm. cold, cold, cold rain. Yeah. Um, very long hair. Very long hair, yes. I, I think her hair would get wet. I yeah. Know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's darn long She hair. volunteers her handkerchief. How nice yeah, of her. That's very nice. <laughs> exactly. Um, she assumes she's going to get it back the next day. <laughs> um, it's also funny how the show 
uh, plays off of harem uh, uh, stereotypes where in so many shows you have the guy surrounded by cute girls but in this while he's surrounded by cute girls it's not nearly the same dynamic no it's 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 definitely definitely a different dynamic mm. and uh the the interest there he he has he's only expressed a little bit of interest yeah um yeah, he he clearly has a crush on Mikuru clearly um and she is cute and all those sorts but of things but he hasn't made any moves no well not, not any anything other than <laughs> a little bit of uh, uh a little bit of flirting here yes and there. exactly um and he's he's uh not intervened in certain cir- circumstances that allowed Mikuru to do certain cute things or otherwise. Yeah, he's, 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 he, he's not going to stop her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not anything beyond good mm, common decency. You know? Yeah. But and, and here, here's a great example of how carefully Kyoto Animation thought about this show. Look at how Kion uh, pulls the heater out of the box and how just you know, all, all the... Uh, the styrofoam packaging, yeah. the plugs... Just all those little <laughs> movements. Notice how when he turns mm. the, the heater on, um, there's that, you know, there's that force to p- s- s- switch it on, and then it switches all the way to the side. Uh, you, know, you really feel the physicality <laughs> of that button exactly. Yeah. Uh, just really thoughtfully done. Ah, and the cold <laughs> is slowly being dissipated. Of course, yeah. he's wet at this point, <laughs> so he's a lot colder than. The people who are cold in the room already. Right. <laughs> and we see on the blackboard behind him some photos from the Mystery Island getaway. <laughs> Just a kind of cute little the reference mystery, there. Yes. Uh, he a game. Comes card back to his, little, or... his card game that they've interrupted so rudely. <laughs> and then Kion gets really tired and uh, sort of conks out for a while. And then we had that wonderful little moment when he wakes back up and Haruhi is kind of surprised. Now, the implication is that she was about to draw something on him or uh, otherwise mess with him <laughs> now that he's asleep, but she doesn't quite have that expression. No. Her expression is, is more one of just not knowing quite how to react. <laughs> um, whereupon you, you discover that uh, uh, he has a couple of cardigans on him and one of them happens to be Haruhi's cardigan. Wow. Yeah. Is there a little bit of interest on her part there? Maybe. Oh, she's being kind to him. A little bit. Poor guy sleeping. <laughs> yeah. This is possible. A little hint that something's going on there. Maybe but, she's not a com- completely But she cold. takes hers and he still has one. Yeah. So, so who somebody else? else? Cardigan was there? Hmm. hmm. Probably Nagato. Presumably. Or... Could it be possibly hers? Yeah. yeah, one of those. Who two? knows? Who knows? So they decide to. But it's late at night. He late has night. fallen asleep. He was bushed from <laughs> carrying that thing up the mountain, climbing, hiking with a heavy load in the rain and the cold. And now they're still. It's it's still raining, and they have an umbrella. Yeah, which <laughs> which, which belongs to the teachers. <laughs> the teachers, of course, that doesn't borrow, bother her. Nah. She's. Uh, yeah, it's uh, from the school, and that's what it's for. <laughs> so now, if you know that this is episode twenty-six, you can you can appreciate the sort of structure of these final moments, um, because it is kind of you know the end of the story. Oh. So this is a little bit of a. Uh, if yeah. you're going with the DVD, series. yeah, if you're going with the, the, the DVD. Oh, order. Look at her; she's. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our final image is that little raspberry that she is uh, giving to us at, at the end of the episode, which is uh, so it's, it's a sweet episode. It's, it's a, a sweet way to end. Very sweet, uh, at least in terms it, of the overall story. It was comforting. Story. It was comforting. You yeah. go from a cold, rainy mm-hmm. outside to warm, cozy inside. Friends who are taking care of each other. That's a great way of putting it. Absolutely, yeah. they are. Um, you know, they they've come together as a group. Yeah, uh, we, we, I think we've talked before about the Japanese concept of wa, which is the idea of the... the Refresh the fu- me on wa. So wa is the Japanese functioning of the group. You know, how ah. everyone is... Wa! <laughs> how everyone is um, uh, functioning to make that group a functioning whole. Um, everyone has, kind of has a place. And it doesn't mean that everyone is happy with each other all the time. Oh, that, that would be unrealistic. Exactly. I'm not even happy with myself half the time. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, behind us, um, on, on both sides, we have great examples of Wa, where in Tenchi, by the end of that first OVA, the characters, there we go, um, the characters find their Wa. 
Ryoko and Ayaka are still, you know, arguing every chance they get. But that is their place within there. They, they found that. Cowboy Bebop, after a, a while, everyone kind of finds their position within that, on, on the Bebop. Um, and so you, you get that, that, um, uh, that idea. So this is all about Wa. This is all about how that group has found its, um, uh, its, its groove. Hmm. The, the, the machinery of, of coexistence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is very important in a country where everyone, you know, we have a lot of people living in small very amounts of land. Together. Yeah, you, you kind of all have to figure out ways of living together. So moving on from that to Boogie Pop Phantom. Boogie Pop. Boogie Pop Phantom. I love that I can do that now in the <laughs> microphone and it sounds right. <laughs> so this is, and we were talking about this before, um... Um, this we're now on episode four of Boogie Pop Phantom, and what I argue is their most daring episode, My Fair Lady. I have to agree that that was uh, one where I said, "Oh wow, um, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty serious. That's heavy." <laughs> so rather than going through sort of um, moment by moment, uh, I think this will make a little more sense if we just kind of tackle the themes directly. Yeah. Um, so there are kind of two themes going at once or two kind of storylines one is about this drug called type s type s Uh-oh. which is being sold or 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 parade around as aromatherapy it's just aromatherapy oh that sounds like something that is really on the market these days <laughs> yeah. they, with the bath salts right supposedly that people are you know the synthetic <laughs> yeah. synthetic stuff so yeah that that i wonder if that's uh mm. truth mirroring fiction yeah and that, wow. that kind of amazing <laughs> Um, so and, S, yeah, type S, type S, and then the other is this young man who is obviously kind of ostracized and and uh, or maybe he's ostracized himself, but is very much alone and he goes home and he plays these uh, video games, and they're not just any kind of video game. He is playing a gal game, a gal game, a visual novel. And there are lots of different terms for these, so you will hear us. Now, now what, what what exactly are these gal games? Is that a choose your own adventure type of game? Very or? much so. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I'll, I'll use the term visual novel as kind of the, the larger overall term for these games that are basically choose your own adventure stories with anime style art and dialogue that is printed on the bottom of the screen with with uh, voice acting along with them. So imagine your character is waking up in the beginning of the day and you know there's a, a, a girl standing there um, and so you'd see an image of the bedroom with a girl there and then a line of dialogue of her talking and so the, the um, uh, gal games are specifically games in which uh, you are a male protagonist and there are a bunch of girls in your life and you uh, get to spend time with them and choose um, based on your decisions which one you're going to spend the most time with Hmm. which will be your, your girlfriend, for lack of a better word. So, so sort of like a social situation emulator. Yes. And they evolved out of, actually, um, adult content back in the day. And I, I mean just straight adult content because you couldn't... Um, we all we both remember back in, in the very early days of video games, you couldn't really get photorealistic images... 8-bit. In the early days, yeah. But you could get <laughs> anime-style art. Yeah. And it would look pr- pretty good. So a lot of the early adult games, um, which, which were just basically um, <laughs> a bunch of adult art just sort of in sequence, um, <laughs> that's how they started. And they started adding in storylines. They started adding in decision points hmm. to actually make it into a story. And then that evolved. And, and kind of ironically, you started getting non-adult storylines oh, told thank that goodness. way. Yeah. Uh, other people can enjoy the uh, <laughs> the technology, if not the content. <laughs> yes. Um, and so now the, the sort of stereotypical visual novel or gal game um, is one in which you're surrounded by a bunch of different girls and um, you, you choose which one you spend um, time with. And there, there will be one or two, let's say, adult sequences during that. But most of it will be just sort of your, your normal day-to-day interactions. Now, he's playing this gal game, um, and we see, first off, very clearly, um, that he's only focused on one, on one character, and hyper-focused. dang if she doesn't look young. Yeah, he's hyper-focused <laughs> on this girl. And... <laughs> yeah, we don't even see any of the other uh, girls in this game. Um, but he's focused on the one that looks most like she's 12. Yeah. Um, which is a little creepy. Yeah, the guy's in the dark there, mm-hmm. so he's all alone yeah. in this room in the dark. Mm-hmm. Checking out 
this girl. Yeah, and we, we can all assume, you know, especially at this time of visual novel development, is probably an adult game. There's probably adult content involved. Now, what this episode is is very clearly dealing with is this idea of the downsides of these sorts of games. You know, the fact mm. that um, you know, we all acknowledge these games are out there and they exist, but they're basically saying there are some psychological potential psychological effects yeah, of get, playing these games you know, exclusively. He's he he he's obviously not wanting anybody else to know about this because yeah. he's isolated himself. Mm -hmm. And so there's already a little bit of uh, concern. <laughs> he's isolating himself from others and doing engaging in an activity that mm -hmm. he wouldn't want others to know about. So he's, yeah. he's withdrawing mm -hmm. to some degree mm -hmm. from, from his natural social interactions yeah. to a place where he can make decisions on his own time mm -hmm. about how his social fantasy world will progress. Yeah. And then that's intertwined with another storyline about a, a girl who comes to uh, apply for a job at the restaurant where he works at. And he discovers that she is uh, underage, uh, which means that she'd be about 14 years old because she's not quite in high school yet. And, um, and she certainly looks like she could be in high school. Mm -hmm. So we can, we, we can assume 14-ish. Um, You're right on the cusp there of being... Mm hmm Yeah. And this sort of then kicks off his fantasies because she is very similar physically. To the girl, to the girl in the, the game. game. And he, and uh oh, he, his fantasy yeah. takes that <laughs> and starts thinking, Oh, girl in the game. Oh man. Girl at the restaurant. Girl at the game. Girl at the restaurant. There's that line, uh, which we, we both commented on when it came on. Um oh. um she's a a um a girl so fragile her bones would break if, if you, you squeezed if her. You squeezed her. That's dang creepy. Ah, uh, that's <sighs> creepy. That's creepy for the story. That's creepy for even more creepy for real life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, she's fragile. I mean, I, yeah, I understand sure. that point. But when put in that context, <laughs> it definitely goes mm -hmm. in, into the creep zone. <laughs> exactly. And so one of the other elements of this is how manipulatable that character is. Mm. You know, the... the the, one of the, the downsides of these visual novels and the way they portray characters is that your choices determine how that character behaves. The outcome is determined by you. You can drive them into this situation or that situation. They have no will of choice. their own. Yeah, you know, the, 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 it, it is completely dependent on how you, how you behave with them. And we see that bleed over into his real life. And, and, and you can play the game again, I take yeah. it. So you can always get your way if you mm -hmm. learn the method that you need to control somebody. Exactly. You can just reset. Uh, and in fact, we see that later on in the episode where we see he is apparently, well, one of two um, possibilities, but we see a screenshot of, of the game and we see this girl that he's working with as the character. He's, he, he, he has a flyer and a disc for CG school, so yeah. I'm thinking he's modded this game mm -hmm. to look like the girl Probably. that he has made concessions to hire and we've already employer. And we've already seen that he recorded an audio clip of her voice. Her, her voice, even. <laughs> so he, he's modded it to mm -hmm. control her image. Yeah. And, and, and that really is, I think, the, the danger that they're, they're showing here is that... Um, you can get so wrapped up in these easily manipulable um, versions of girls that it's easy for that to kind of bleed over into your real life yeah. and your 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 actual interactions with with normal people. And one of the things I like about this is it's not that he um, immediately goes out and treats her exactly like this. No, no. Um, but he he starts small, like you know. He gives her her uniform, and it happens to be the smallest uniform they have. And he gets rid of in the garbage <laughs> the normal size uniform that would be a little bit more discreet mm -hmm. and uh, less revealing. Yeah. So he's he's beginning to manipulate in real life mm -hmm. to some degree. Yeah. And he continues on that path. Yeah. He can manipulate very easily in the digital realm, mm. in his fantasies, and he can continue to manip manip manipulate to some degree, in mm. real life. Yeah. But that division line between real life and fantasy seems to be blurred by his consumption of S. The drug, yes. The drug. Um, yeah, th there's something about that that is clearly clouding his his um, judgment um, and, and clearly addicting him 
Uh, and, and we see over the course of the episode, he's using more and more of it as time goes on, which is how it works. One drop. Oh, now yeah. two drops. Get him off. Mm-hmm. Three drops at work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's a bad sign. He's suddenly getting mm-hmm. high at work. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm assuming one of the reasons he's doing that is because he wants her to also be experiencing the drug, mm-hmm. which will make her a little bit more open and a little more, you know, um, easy, to, easy to manipulate. Um, so it goes in increasingly um, disturbing directions, and he's kind of lording over her the fact that he knows that she's underage and that he could get her fired, basically. She wants to continue working, but if mm. that news got out, it would destroy yeah. her future? Well, I mean, at the very least, um, she could get expelled from school. Oh, that that determines her whole future, though. Yeah. She's studying to get into school, into right. a specific uh, uh, high school, mm-hmm. or beyond that. Everything determines, and so he has a lot of power. Yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing. Um, he thinks he has a lot of power. Aha, the delusions. And we, and we consistently see the show kind of undermining that. Like, in all of his conversations, he's talking about this girl, and they're all like, yeah, 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 what about this Type S thing? Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's hopped online, and he's, he's talking about his, his, his pursuits of her and uh, fantasy and how he's... She, she's his uh, lady... What was it? Uh, the the, my the fair, show that... My, my Fair, fair lady. lady, yeah. So he's he's got this illusion of this... But nobody's concerned with that conversation. <laughs> they all want to know where he got the type S. When My Fair Lady is also a great thing you brought up because the whole idea of that is very similar where there's this girl that a, a guy brings in and kind of molds into this specific trains shape. Trains her. Yes, trains I'm her. I'm not owl. <laughs> I'm not owl. And it's all about him, you know, molding this girl. He even goes as far as to say, I've taught you how to sit, how to cross yeah. your legs, how to do this. Mm-hmm. It's really creeping her out, but he, she's kind of stuck doing some of that stuff. Right. And, well, that, that's, that's the funny thing. It's <laughs> I, I love about this episode is that you know, we then get to that point where um, he send, uh, he tells her how to sit down. You know, <laughs> that and sounds so insane. It, it sounds insane, but in, in, to be fair, it's because she's got this very short skirt, and so he's explaining, here's how to sit down in such a way that you're not going to reveal your panties or whatever. Um, and so she clearly gets, you know, like he's crossed a line at that point. And so she goes to her manager and says, yeah, he's creeping me out. And he goes, yeah, you're right. I'm going to fire him. Just boom, you know, <laughs> and in like that's... 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> she was scared of him. Man. Yeah. Uh, and legitimately. And, and, and he doesn't he doesn't see all these directions that uh, as yeah. being creepy. He's, no. he's in his delusional world. Mm-hmm. His parents are trying to t- counsel him to, hey, you know, just get into a state school. We're not asking you to go to the the best of the best, mm. just get into some school. But he's given up studying yeah. in pursuit of the fantasy world, mm-hmm. fueled by the drug. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing is, I mean, when I saw that flyer for the computer school, I was a little worried that they were implying that, oh, computer school is, you know, eh, hey, on hey, the side. Well, yeah, but, that's serious stuff. But, um, you know, then when we, we realized... He, he only wants that to mod the exactly. thing so he could do that. But he, he'd given up his studies at that yeah. point. And, uh, the parents trying to get to him mm-hmm. didn't work. Doesn't work too well. But um, we also have this story where he oh, has a supplier. Of yes. <laughs> and it was, was that a girl from school that he's? Yes. Um, so there is a girl from school, and I'm trying to um, find her name here. Uh, and, yeah, she is very much a pawn in all of this thing. The, the poor thing. One thing about this show that's kind of amazing is there's so many characters. It's hard to keep track of all the names and people, but I remember the girl had, at some point, rose-colored glasses. Uahara. That's Uh-ha- the one. Uahara. Uahara. Uh, um, I tell you. So she, she got addicted to the S at some point. Mm-hmm. There was a, a guy who was giving it to her in an alley. And so that's an interesting thing. Then so she we, became a dealer. So we see a couple of things here. Um, we see... Um, uh, we see Uehara. Yeah, I, I, I love that outfit she has on. I'm going to see if I can get an uh, image of it here. Um, where is she? But yeah, um, and so she, she's wearing this this great this, this crop top, hmm. um, very kind of mod outfit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those rose glasses, kind of uh, slightly 60s, 70s style rose glasses. Um, and so she's got a supplier S, more S. More of that type S. When, and when, when he goes to get some S from her, she says, oh, I've already smoked some of yours already. Mm-hmm. <gasps> and he's fine with that, as long as Just she has more Just give me more, more S. <laughs> yeah, which is, again, eh. 
Um, but this is the interesting thing, is... Maybe that was her. Um, nope. So, one of the remarkable things about that whole storyline is the fact that you then see her... Eh, you, um, you then see her in the alleyway, and she is being supplied by what, by what appears to be um, Sao Tome, a.k.a. the Manticore Phantom, from mm. episode one. Yeah. Um, and the other interesting thing about that is we don't see any spirit stuff going on. No, it's all just... And, of course, we don't know. It, it could be he's could just... Be just, just yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's definitely him. It's the same voice actor. We also see Nagi Kirima. What's she doing there? Why would she be there? very similar to her. Yeah, and it sounds like the same voice actress. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, for those of you who kind of seen the show, we know that there are various phantoms going around that were created by the Column of Light event. And and one of the girls in early yeah. in the episodes mentions, oh, I thought I saw her down, yeah. down in that area. Exactly, and, and that, that's a, it's a very important point, is that we see Toka and some of her friends um, at, the, um, at the restaurant talking about how they, they saw Nagi around here somewhere. So that's, again, kind of your hint that something weird is going on there story-wise with, with Nagi or who appears to be Nagi Kirima. Um, unfortunately, Uehara doesn't last long. No. When she meets both of them in the alley, she mm-hmm. asks for her S. Yeah. Did she get some and then... She, no. No, she, she, got, she got eaten. She gets, she gets eaten. Um, <laughs> and in one of the, the, the more impressively shocking moments, I think, in the series, because she's just talking to her dealer, and you know something bad is going down, and then they just cut to this shot of... Uh, let's be honest, if you haven't seen the episode, apologies for the spoiler, but you just see her brain getting blown out of the back of Here her head. There she is with her she rose-colored her. glasses, there her she lighter. Is. She's ready to Love that. light up her S. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she, 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 likes, she likes the drugs so much that mm. she's, she's willing to pursue them yeah. with this guy and... <laughs> she sure does. She, we find out. We find out from the dialogue in that alley mm. that S S doesn't stand for cinnamon. I mean, obviously yeah. C and S are two different <laughs> letters, unless you're <laughs> writing in Cyrillic or something. Mm. C doesn't S doesn't stand for cinnamon. It stands for slave. Yes, which is what has become of her mm-hmm. from using all this S. Yeah. She's become a slave to the S, and mm. she, so she has to come back to her dealer. Yeah. And now the person who she's been selling it to is coming straight to the dealer because she's out of the picture. I mean, she's being eaten by. Which is a great metaphor, um, and I think a, a, a strong metaphor for what those kinds of things can do to you. The addiction. Yeah, I mean, w- one of the things I love is that you know they're not talking about the effects of the drug. They're not talking about what's going on. They're saying the problem is it binds you to you the person are providing the slave. it. Yeah, you know, you're you're dependent on it. That's not a good thing. Um but of course, you know, you're dependent on it. So what do you do? You got to do something. Um and so we, we we see this, you know, um developing further and further and uh uh it's it's pretty bad. I mean, mm. he's he's very far down, but as we said as we saw, you know, he is he volunteers at that point for something, doesn't he? He says, "Yes, just give me the S. Yeah. I'll do whatever. Yeah, I'll and, become the slave." And he's ready to recruit other people. And which is he, pretty bad. And and they have a special stipulation on recruiting mm-hmm. other people. I think was it? It was yes. People who uh, will keep a secret mm-hmm. and people with some sort of an attitude, like a negative attitude. negative attitude. Yeah, that's very strange. They put that stipulation on mm-hmm. on that, which makes me think there's something more to this than just. Yeah. The drug use. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and there, there's the implication. And as we see in the next episode, there's obviously a lot more going on here. Um, not just in terms of weird stuff going on, but there's actual, like, um, you know, concerns about... Cool. As We're... I was saying, this about that. Yeah. So we definitely... We definitely see here the, the larger worries about the larger plot. You know, with this whole idea of enslavement... There's this idea that, man, we may have some um, bigger fish to fry in terms of the storyline. That's Pretty a very scary. big eye. That's a very big eye, <laughs> in, indeed. <laughs> well, you know, we like to kind of get these these things across. Um, and then what happens at the end? You know, I, poor guy, uh, kind of. Well, it, it's one month later, mm-hmm. and the guy who is freaking out. Yep. He's lost his job. 
Mm. His parents, I don't know what they probably kicked him out. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. I mean, the way things were going there. And uh, he's he he's kind of lost it. I yeah. think the the S has kind of driven his brain into a state, and yeah. he's kind of made some life choices that have mm. really taken him to a bad spot. So the police realize this, and they're yeah. trying to subdue him. And we remember this scene from earlier because we saw it in an earlier episode. Um, we saw the uh, from a different perspective, though. Yes, the girls were passing by, and yeah. there's this guy being held by the police. Yeah, and he is calling out to them about uh, this this girl that he he maybe thinks they look like, and we realize they walk by, and one of them says, uh, "So who is Panaru?" The same place that yeah. the opposite. Per- <laughs> <laughs> and then we hold for like several seconds on this shot and, and the volume actually comes up a little bit as we hear that who is Panaru as they walk past and we kind of hold on this moment and I think they're really trying to drive home the fact that Panaru is all about you know, sort of distancing yourself to an extreme from the world around you hmm. whereas as we saw in the previous episode right yeah uh, and this episode is very much about becoming so obsessed with a single thing yeah, the the, he he got so close to the object of his desire, mm. but he isolated himself from everything, and yeah. he has nothing now. Well, and that, that's the sad thing is that you you get the sense that I mean she seemed like a perfectly you know, normal nice girl. Um, if he had approached her as a normal human being, <laughs> rather than <laughs> right, rather than as as a um, controlling. Well, it's a funny thing. Like he wanted to turn her into his anime character in a real way. Uh, and kind of that visual novel character. He he was trying to sort of force that on the real girl. Whereas if he just approached her as a real girl and said, "Hey, you want to you know go out for burgers or something?" He probably would have had a better chance. A much better chance. <laughs> uh, treat people reasonably, and they'll <laughs> respond. Imagine that. But she, yeah, she. Yeah. Uh, She's not not so interested now. Yeah. Quite understandably. Definitely. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it it's. It's not good when you get into those sorts of things. Definitely one of the most mature theme yeah. ones that uh, I've seen in this series. So, Well, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that gets into sort of computer addiction. Drugs. Drugs. Sex. Sex. Well, and it, not just sex, but... Let's, uh, let's just say it, underage. Underage sex. Yeah. Um, his desire for something that's <laughs> definitely... Uh, Pushing the limits there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that... Uh, Sex and drugs and... Hey, yeah. It's something that, you know... rock and roll, but... <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that's there in, in fandom, and that, that stuff exists. And so it's nice seeing a show at least addressing it on some level. Yeah. Um, moving on to the interlude. So this is kind of an interesting little episode of Boogie Pop Phantom. The interlude. Where... That's episode five? Episode five. Set in a cop, um, a, a, a one of those patrol booths. Yeah, patrol booths, and you. These are very common in Japan. There are these tiny little, um, like a kiosk, like a guard. Um, yeah, basically. Just, yeah, guard shack, just a little bit larger. Yeah, just like big enough for like two people. Every prefecture seems to have a little police unit, not a full station, but. Uh, and I mean, uh, more than each prefecture, almost every. Street corner. Every block. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so we get this conversation, which quickly goes very strange, and which is building on that previous episode. So we're starting to get some, some larger backstory and back plot about the, the, uh, the episode. And um, so, so they start out with these two cops talking about mm. a website and rumors on yeah. a website and how there's some conspiracy and, and mm-hmm. the 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 thinner, I suppose, younger mm. seeming cop is uh, sort of skeptical, but he brings sure. it up and he he mentions he's kind of feeling some deja vu. Yeah, strange. Wonder yeah. if we'll get some deja vu later. I think we might. <laughs> and then we get this this, this stuff <laughs> in the middle, and we were commenting about how how much fun it is that we now finally spend some time with Toka Miyashita. Yes. And we've seen Toka a little bit. This is the girl who's always carrying the duffel bag or often carrying the duffel bag around. Um, and she seems like this very normal high school girl. Uh, slightly lighter hair than normal. Uh, and we see... Actually, the hair is something we should mention uh, here. One of the things Boogie Pop Phantom does that's a little 
um, different than a lot of anime characters, you don't see any weird anime hair. Hmm. There's no blue hair, no... No pink hair, crazy spiky. And... Yeah. Everyone's got pretty much black hair, dark brown like hair. Like real, maybe. realistic people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the kind of hair you'd see in Not, in, not that people with Japan. unusual hair are unrealistic, but yeah. they're not as common. It's, it's right. a rare to Well, especially no. in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's highlights, but not the mm. anime style hair. <laughs> exactly. Which make, often makes it hard to tell who's who. Um, and it's a great example of, of why we have those weird hairstyles. Otherwise, people tend to kind of look the same when they're simplified this much for animation. Uh, and we see Toka, and we know that Toka is kind of in the center of all this, but she has this completely mundane, average life, which is kind of nice. Those of you who've seen Project Eiko, um, Eiko's family is kind of like this, although there's some secrets there, but you know, it's kind of very normal, average life. Um, and so uh, we, we see her preparing for the day and going about things. Uh, and we started to see some, some backstory. There's some interesting little sequence in here um, about these cracks in the wall. And I wanted to bring that up because it's hinting at something. Foreshadowing. Yeah. What's um, going on? The, the, they just laid this foundation here, and it's already cracked. Mm-hmm. We just put in all this steel, and it's already rusted. Mm-hmm. Well, we should have checked it. Whose responsibility was was this? Oh, it was yours, Chief. <laughs> you already inspected it. Well, he obviously wouldn't have inspected bad stuff and mm-hmm. sent it in. Mm-hmm. So something's going on that's prematurely aging all this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, of course, then we immediately cut to this house that's overgrown already with a vegetation. Speaking of prematurely aging. <laughs> yeah. And we come in on this uh, old woman who has died, and she has this flower in her mouth. Now That's weird. You now, the immediate image, I think, um, us outside would uh, look at this and, and imagine that there are flowers growing out of her. Um, those more familiar with, with uh, Asian iconography would know that this is a flower placed in her mouth uh, and leaves placed on her um, uh, on her eyes. Um, is, so it's, it's, is that something that's done to dead people there? Or? In some ancient contexts. Sort of like the pennies on the eyes yeah. to pay the ferryman. Right, exactly, across the river Styx. Um, so this is going back to some um, earlier stuff, and that, that flower is a specific flower as well, uh, without getting too much into spoilers. So we get this conversation between the police officers, and we find out that she left a message about her daughter. Um, yes, please please take care of my daughter. Her granddaughter. My granddaughter. I'm sorry, yes. Minaka. And, Minaka, exactly. And, and there's a, a picture that they find. However, the granddaughter is shown as five years old, but she's standing up and it yeah. looks she, like she's taller than the grandmother Yeah, I mean, at she, five. Yeah, she looks more like 14 or something yeah. in that, which is quite strange. Um, but we get a bit of this kind of backstory idea, and, and we also recognize the cop. Come um, back to cop. <laughs> yeah, so he's one of the cops in that little prefectural or little co- uh, street corner um, office. And so it's quite odd that we would have all this vegetation growing over something without anyone noticing it. Yeah. We also cut back and have, they're having a conversation again. Again, about uh, uh, another one of these uh, rumors, odd mm. things, paranormal kind of websites. And, and rumors yeah. is another theme that, that weaves its way through Boogie Pop Phantom. Um, all of the kids are talking about different rumors in their school. Uh, there's rumors on the streets about what's going on. And it's interesting seeing authority figures... Yeah. Do you believe in that? I don't know, but it's a conspiracy <laughs> theory. That... Yeah. But it, it, gosh, it seems like deja vu. Uh. <laughs> they, 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 and, and we continually cut back and forth to these mm. two police officers having a conversation. Yeah. And they cover several different things like that, mm-hmm. uh, including kids with powers yeah. and composite humans. Mm. And uh, we learn a little bit more as it progressive as it progresses, but it's very uh, small segments that we get. Yeah, very and, little bits. And each one seems to end with the younger police officer having a deja vu or mm. a very strange feeling about having had that experience or a conversation before. And that's the neat thing about those sequences is because they're not saying the same thing over and over again. They're saying something different each time. Yeah, but he still did has this in deja vu. Did he hear that before? Yeah. No, no. What's going on? <laughs> something strange. So then you get this little sequence between... Um, oh, Maggie uh, and the 
the cheater yeah, girl. Yeah, the cheater girl with <laughs> Not glasses. Not the cheetah girl, we, but we, we tend to uh, her name call is, her that. Uh, what is it? S- um, su- looking her up right now. Su- I've, got, I've got too many notes in front of me right su- now. Su- um, su- Suema. Suema, 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 I think. Suema. Yes. Suema um, Kazuko. There we go. The girl who cheated and had the spider mm. eaten an off her. Yes. <laughs> and, and here, yeah. <laughs> Only in anime. Um, <laughs> and so... And here we, we, we see this interesting moment between the two of them uh, because she meets Nagi and we, we get this interesting moment where they both just sit down and talk. Yeah. So they're, they're clearly a little more familiar with each other. Didn't they meet on the roof and there was some dialogue yeah. about her, her father, uh, Nagi's yes. father's book. book? Yeah. Exactly. So there's clearly something between the two of them. Um, and they're, they're willing to kind of talk back and forth about what's going on there. The light from five years ago. And mm-hmm. there was a killer who was uh, after Suimo's, Suimo uh, yeah. five years earlier. Yeah. And she was the next on the list. Mm. And, so, of course, she's still around. So apparently the killer stopped for right. what purpose? Did they, the killer get caught? Or and what? it's interesting that, that Nagi, uh, that she's asking Nagi about it. And Nagi why would, would Nagi know? know? Yeah. She was in the hospital at that time. Right, and but she was talking to a detective. So uh, something's maybe, going maybe on. She, maybe she thinks that Nagi mm-hmm. knows something that Nagi's not sharing. And Nagi is clearly a little annoyed that Suema realized this. She's yeah. kind of frustrated by this, but she she, she inquires about Toka. Well, so that's that's I love this little moment where Nagi turns around and says, "Hey, do you know Toka?" And to which Suema says, "From from the other class, right? I've heard her name." And Nagi says, um, "It'd be interesting if you you know talk to her." Is she giving her a lead? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that because um, one, of, one of the things you see about Nagi throughout all this is that she is clearly forging her own path. Hmm. She's trying to learn things. She is not trying to manipulate. No. And this is her She's way. She's the truest character there yeah, in that respect. Exactly. And so this is her way of kind of hinting and saying, you know, that might not be a bad idea. But... If you don't do it, she doesn't it's force fine. it. Here's an option. <laughs> exactly. So it's a little strange, but then <laughs> no stranger than the cops. Those guys are strange. Yeah, and so we get to this whole story, and so, so this, they have this interesting backstory. This idea that one in a million children are born with some kind of powers. Yeah. And there's this group that's that's observing this, and they decided to kill them all. Yeah, at some point, the composite humans who are yeah. sent out to uh, to to kill these ch- mm. children with special powers. Uh huh. But we're getting more and more of these children with special powers recently, so mm. something's not adding up there. Um, but we do get more from this guy revealing kind of what's going on there. Um, and meanwhile, we get some some back and forth between Toka and Suema uh, at the hospital. So they, they sort of cross paths at the hospital. And we've seen this hospital before. This is the hospital that we saw in the first episode, the prefectural hospital where that creepy female doctor, woman doctor is That's that operating. same spot. And there was some mention about uh, in, in, early on uh, when the police were investigating mm. the old woman who had yeah. who'd, who'd died, there was some discussion about a special serum or drug that yeah. had uh, been taken away mm-hmm. to this hospital and had disappeared. Yeah, which but, may have come from that organization, that shadowy... The, the organization. The Toa organization, he was, he was calling it. Uh, whereupon, Suema comes across Manaka. Manaka at the bus stop? Yep. So here she is, and she's actually near the hospital, and we've seen her near the grounds of the hospital before. And she's around got all the butterflies. Yeah, there, she has yeah. all these glowing butterflies around her. Now, we all know that butterflies have certain symbolic... Um, Memories, kind of yes, like the snippets. bugs that uh, mm-hmm. uh, the spider-eating guy exactly. had. Except these, when they hit you, you kind of experience them. Yeah, you experience somebody else's memories. And so she's hit by these butterflies. We saw four flying at her, and she sees the conversation between Nagi and the detective from earlier. Where In the, the hospital? Where they're talking about what to do. Oh, what to do with their lives? Yeah. You know, do you... Follow through with justice? or mm, Kind of let things happen or not. Uh, then she moves over and she sees basically half a body. Um, you know, intestines all splayed out everywhere. Um, and above the body is that creepy woman doctor from the hospital. Uh. Looking, looking over it, which is a little scary. Uh. Um, oh, and, and this, then... This- 
point. Yeah, and then the we injection. see... Is that the... That's the... That's Menaka's that's mother. Menaka's mother, yeah. She's being given a serum in the hospital. And part of the backstory is the grandmother mm. raised Menaka yeah. because uh, the daughter... Mm-hmm. Uh, who the the her Manaka's mother mm-hmm. uh, had some sort of uh, trouble at birth, yeah, and some it's sort of brain away, damage basically. occurred, yeah. and, and and was no longer available mm. to uh, raise her, yeah, because she was not altogether there, right? But we know we know Manaka has been at the hospital quite a bit, for some period, um, and so then we we come back from that sort of memory sequence. And it's quite interesting because we come back and there's still one butterfly um, that the Manaka has not absorbed. allowed to touch. <laughs> yeah. But then when we come back to Manaka, she's absorbing three butterflies. Yeah, that's strange. Is, is she swapping out memories? Or? Apparently she's taken two memories from Suema. And I don't know if this is a destructive process or not. I'm, I'm not saying she's sucking it out of her, her but it's possible she's copying these memories. Over to her. Um, we'll find out later on. Yeah, they're, they're oh, those three they change butterflies. from a butterfly to spheres, and, and she does. holds them, cradles and, them, and, and they come. Wow. And, and she off she goes. <laughs> 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 off she goes. So kind of strange. And then again, Toka shows up, and we have a little conversation between the two of them on the bus. Um, and they talk about cram school. Yeah. They decide they're going to go to cram school. Um, and and again, th- this is kind of reinforcing uh, how. <laughs> Toka, despite being in the center of all this, she's going, oh, good, you're going to the same cram school I am. That's such a relief. Because when other people see you going to a cram school, they think you're kind of weird. So it's really nice that, you know, it's totally mundane high Just school regular, stuff. regular, everyday conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so they have this uh, uh, just this little conversation where upon we get these, these kind of interesting things from Toka. Toka just keeps saying odd things. And then when they leave at the crossroads, there's a very weird moment where Monaka, I'm sorry, where um, where Toka says, I'm going to see if I have the, the line down here. I don't think I do. Um, um, where Toka turns and has this very deliberate stare oh, contest. Yeah, that contest. was very unusual because her voice is... It's kind of different. It's uh, she's mm-hmm. a ways away, but still she turns and ha- directs her directly addresses her. Mm-hmm. And we have this this very interesting background behind her of, of people moving, um, and I, I think they're very deliberately making them move in this kind of slow motion behind Toka as she's talking, and drawing attention to the yeah. And she has this this almost monotonous delivery to her, very very yeah. serious, um, and it's a delivery you might recognize from earlier in the show. Um, it almost seemed like it wasn't her. Yeah, it, it was it, it so almost, it was so serious yeah. and not like trivial as the conversation was. It's almost like boogie pop. Yeah, it would hmm. be kind of strange. And then uh, Swami just says, "Eh, she's a, she's a strange girl." <laughs> <laughs> I think nothing of it. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, we co- yeah. And so now, pum, pum. hey, so we see a character that will show up in, in later episodes. This. Little kid in like a Robin Hood outfit. Yeah, it's very strange. I'll never grow up. Yep, yep. <laughs> Who we will uh, learn later is named Poom Poom. Uh, I say Robin Hood outfit. It's actually a Peter Pan outfit. Is it more of a Peter Pan? There we go. Yeah. That that's really the 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 implication there. And he seems to actually. I mean, they 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 take hands. So he seems to be taking her away. They they almost as if they're friends there. Yeah. It seems like they've become friends. And mm-hmm. That little hmm. wash of white, and uh, and then there's some Butterfly. some some dialogue as people realize that Monaka has left the hospital. And we where'd s- she go? We, oh, she, that where was that girl who was here? And it's interesting the dialogue because the, the person says, "I only turned my eyes um, away from her for a second. She's been outside for a while. Yeah, that, that that's a long second. Is that yeah. healthcare maybe being slack? <laughs> maybe it, it certainly is inconsistent. And then we see a butterfly memory sort of waft away and and disappear off to the side somewhere. I wonder what's going to happen about with that memory. And it sort of it sort of flies up, and then we come back to our 
uh, our, the police. our police whereupon we we finally kind of the get deja the, vu yet again and again and again and so, yep something funny yeah and we realize the um What's actually going on here with the cop is actually... Um, is it's actually, not just banter. It's real. You, yeah. Um, the, the, the cop, this is, this is definitely a, a bad sign for what's going on. Um, he, he, he explains that these composite humans, the, uh, and, mm-hmm. and they've been talking in theoretical rumors yeah. and websites and mm-hmm. conspiracy stuff. And uh, he mentions the name of one of these uh, composite human snake eyes. Snake eye. Yeah. yeah, snake eye. And so... He does this weird twist with his head and proves that he is not human. He is nope. a composite. Composite people get bored, and so we like to talk about conspiracy. I love that. I love that. That he's, we, he's yeah. like, you know, he, he was always planning to yeah. do whatever he's going to do to this guy, but he's like, you know, I'm bored. I'm just going to sort of talk for a while. Yeah, the snake guy, guy came and swallowed a police officer and took his form. <laughs> Why? Because he's bored. <laughs> and then you get this very interesting kind of epilogue to that where the guy wakes up again. Yeah, it's it's like he keeps repeating a time loop. He's he's not dead. He's not eaten. He's not a composite human. What's going on? What is going on indeed is the interesting question. I'm going to blame that big light at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. So that is where we are with Boogie Pop Phantom. This is definitely turning out as somebody said on the on one of the posts, a sepia riddle yeah it's very dark uh uh visually Mm -hmm. and it is definitely a riddle there are so many different characters so many different motivations Mm -hmm. and it's mind-boggling so putting together all these pieces yeah it's kind of like one of those big russian novels where you kind of need to pay attention to who's who and who's doing what and once you do it's a fascinating experience Mm. but it, it definitely rewards that but as we were saying before, you can also see it just purely as this story about philosophy, about how people approach the world and how they see the world and what is the best way of doing that. What, what, what are proper ways of seeing the world? Uh, you know, we see in Toka this very forthright approach to the world. Um, at the next episode, we will get Mother's Day, which is going to be quite the interesting episode. So that is where we are with Boogie Pop Phantom. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I think that will do it for us for Smoke and Mirrors. Thank you very much for joining us. See ya.